My internal guest today is Evan Hyde. He's a senior software engineer and the head of Internio's real-time integrations. Welcome to the show, Evan. Thank you, Andy. This is the first time I've been on a podcast, so let's have some fun. Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, Do you want to just tell everybody uh, where you are and who you are and how you came to work for Internio? Sure. Um, Yeah, I guess I'll give a little bit of background. Uh, I'm Evan. Uh, I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm actually a Colorado native, but I spent some time elsewhere. I went to school out in Philadelphia, spent some time in Seattle as well. Uh, I think my first job was at IBM, Um, did some software development there. Uh, Then I was at Microsoft doing um, some program management and then I had a, a startup um, that I ran for a while that specialized in or that focused on doing um, some machine learning as it applies to uh, internal combustion engines. We were combining um, machine learning and analytics, um, real time um, data processing uh, with these ultra high performance electrohydraulic fuel injectors. Um, to create a, a, an engine that would sort of teach itself how to run. Um, and when that didn't work, then I came to Intrinio. As it turns out, uh, the sort of real-time data that you focus on with uh, internal combustion engines, it's all time series data, is very similar to the kind of data that we use when we're doing um, like real-time uh, processing of stocks, um, stock prices, option prices, things like that. It's all time series data. Uh, And you can use the sort of the same, I guess, development paradigms or the same programming data structures, um, a lot of the same focuses uh, in order to do both of them. I think I've been at Intrinio now for just over two years, uh, and the problems that I see every day are constantly changing. And um, the projects that I work on, I think there have been sort of like three of them. three big projects, uh, that's always changing and providing like very interesting things to work with and work on every day. Yes. (laughs) And we love that we're your fallback from the AI machine learning engine. Um, Can you tell our audience a little bit um, about what it takes to make a real-time integration? Like, Probably most people listening are interested in fintech and they have websites and stuff and maybe some of them use stock prices. But like if you could just talk a little bit about actually what's going on with real time stock prices, like at the as the person who is actually creating the plumbing, like what is happening there? Oh, OK. Well, that's a fairly involved question. Um, I think. I think the best way to like explain it would just be to start at the beginning. So data is generated by different exchanges. Um, and there are lots of exchanges out there. I'm sure people have heard of uh, NASDAQ. Um, some people may have heard of IEX, uh, NYSE. These are all just different exchanges. And all of these exchanges are allowing individuals to trade uh, securities. It's like an eBay auction, basically. Um, there, where as the product that you're buying on eBay, you know, maybe, you know, a sticker or a car or something. Um, In this case, you're buying ownership of a company, you know, a fractional ownership piece of a company. Uh, I'm talking now about like securities markets, uh, not options markets. Uh, But in these exchanges, yeah, you're buying these little ownership pieces. uh, And every time um, one of these transactions or every time one of these uh, ownership stakes changes hands, um, that gets tracked uh, and logged. Um, also, every time someone puts in a bid, for example, like just on eBay, like you put in a bid, you say, hey, I'm willing to pay $80,000 for this Porsche or whatever the case may be. Um, that's a bid. Or the person on the other side may say, you know, what? I'm looking for a uh, to receive a minimum of $75,000. The same thing happens in these exchanges as well. Uh, there are asks and bids um, as well as trades. When a buyer and a seller come to an agreement, a trade happens, um, and you're going to see that. Uh, so a lot of information is generated on these exchanges um, with asks and bids and trades. And there's, uh, it's happening constantly, or at least during market hours. Well, this information gets sent to a data center, 
um, the pasture data center, I think it's New Jersey or something, um, where we connect to it, uh, a lot of routing happens so that it ends up on a server that we control. And we process this data. Uh, for us, that means filtering out some information. We're providing uh, just top of book data. So that means like only uh, the latest trade, or excuse me, only the latest asks and bids um, or the national best bid and best offer. Um, we're not providing any sort of depth of book to our customers. Uh, but we are consuming all this data. We're gonna, we do a lot of the uh, best bid and best offer um, processing or filtering uh, operations ourselves um, on our servers. So we receive the data, do some sort of transformation with it, make sure the data is clean, um, that we're not passing back stale data, things like that, um, capturing uh, other value add metrics like high price, low price. Uh, we do some other stuff with options as well. Uh, and then we also have to make this data available to our customers because our customers want to be able to consume uh, this information um, and work with it. We don't do a lot of work with the data. We just give it to other people. They do the interesting stuff. So once we have the data, we can distribute it then to our customers in a number of different ways. And our customers consume the data specifically in two ways. Uh, the first is through a REST-based API. Um, that's a, sort of a request response um, type of application. They can query a, a URL and then they receive a response back with information like um, the latest trade for Microsoft, you know, what that latest trade was or what the ask and the bid price are at that very moment for Apple. Uh, that can allow them to do any number of things. If they're creating a trading platform, uh, that allows them to provide that pricing information to their users so they know where and how to execute uh, their orders. Um, or if they're simply doing like display purposes, uh, using data for display purposes, you know, they can then put that information up on their website. Uh, we also provide information to customers via uh, a web socket, um, and that's a, not unlike the request response thing that is the REST-based API, um, the WebSocket uh, provides constant streaming updates. It provides all of the update, uh, all of the updates in real time um, and constantly. You should say, for example, hey, I wanna listen to all of the updates from Microsoft. Um, and then boom, you're gonna be receiving every single update for Microsoft, uh, whether that's you know a trade, an ask or a bid. And it's just going to keep coming in until you tell the connection to close. Um, we have to yeah, do all of this uh, and provide access to everyone that wants it, hundreds of customers, regardless of what platform they choose. Some people may want every single piece of information, regardless of whether it pertains to Microsoft, Apple, or any of the approximately 11 to 12,000 um, securities that are trading on like an IEX or a MIMEX exchange at any given point. So that's a very long-winded explanation of sort of what we do or what I do. Yeah. Well, to me, it, it, it'll keep it turning you in business because if that long-winded answer, all those different pieces, the access, the connection, um, you know, cleaning up of the data, if people weren't getting that data from Intrinio, they'd have to have their own Evan, wouldn't they? Like somebody on their end that's doing all this work. It's, it's kind of a full-time job, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's nuts. It, the fact that it takes like us a long time to get one of these connections stood up and pumping data or consuming data is a testament to just how difficult and how many distributed man hours would go into it if every single one of our customers had to go through the same pain in the ass process that we do. <laughs> yeah. um, so we make it easy, or at least that's the plan. You know, that's the idea is we make it easy. You know, customers put in an API key and press connect and boom, like that, suddenly they're connected to the WebSocket. That's it. Um, instead of going through the you know, 10,000 lines of code um, and uh, it feels like a very political process, like getting established, getting connections, getting approvals with the different exchanges, getting all of the direct connect links set up. I mean, you have to work with uh, the um, individuals that actually like own uh, the on-premise hardware, all the networking connections to the exchanges themselves. You gotta work with, for example, AWS to get that your direct connect link between you know your virtual private cloud and this like on-premise um, network 
uh, in New Jersey configured and working properly. There's a lot that goes into it, and it's it can be quite right. frustrating and very time consuming. So, you know, we've done it once we do it like, you know, it takes our time. But then once we have this working, then our customers, you know, can get their system set up in what should be a matter of minutes. Right. I like to say it's the difference between buying a plane ticket and starting to build your own plane. Um, You know, you're already taking off right out of the gate rather than having to start studying how to make a plane. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the new products that you've been building? By the time this podcast comes out, uh, we'll have released a, a new feed that combines stock exchanges. Can you talk a little bit about um, that process of combining data from multiple exchanges and why that's advantageous? All right. So the latest yeah, product that we've been working on, um, is a feed that combines information from multiple exchanges. Specifically, we're starting out uh, by combining um, data from IEX and the MIMEX exchange. Um, the impetus for doing this was to create a sort of lower cost, but very high quality data feed, something that would mimic uh, a, a SIP feed. Um, a SIP feed is a combination of exchange of data from lots of different exchanges. Uh, it has very tight, um, very strong data. When I say like very strong data, what I mean is that it very accurately refre- reflects the state of the market. So if you see in a SIP feed that Apple's trading at, you know, whatever the price may be, 120 something bucks, like that's what the price is going to be for Apple. Um, but it's very expensive. Um, and very difficult to get access to a SIP feed. There's lots of approval that needs to be done, uh, lots of forms that need to be signed, and lots of money that needs to be paid. Our hypothesis is that you can create uh, a feed that very closely mimics um, a SIP feed, but um, without the same rigorous approval processes and at a far lower cost. Uh, And so that's what our combined feed is. Technically, what we have to do is we have to take data coming from multiple sources. Um, The data may or may not be uh, in sync. That means, for example, a trade that happens on the IEX feed um, may come uh, may come in after a trade that actually um, executed after um, uh, a trade on the MIMEX feed. That may sound kind of confusing, but let's just say trades can come in out of order. Same thing with asks and bids. Uh, We also have to be able to manage um, a best bid and best offer system. Um, So, for example, uh, you always want to see what the uh, the best bids are and the best offers. Like if let's go back to our eBay analogy. I don't really care if I'm selling an item on eBay. um, I don't really care what the lowest offers are for that item. I just care what the best ones are. Um, you know, what? who's willing to pay the highest price for this object that I'm willing to sell? Same thing from a buyer's perspective. Um, I don't really care, like, uh, who's trying to sell their product uh, at the most expensive price. I just care about the least expensive. And so we filter out all that information for you so that you're always seeing um, the best offer and the best bid. So in that case, like, uh, the best bid, bid would be the highest bid, and it would be, um, you know, the lowest ask price. Uh, So being able to do that and do that continuously while trades are coming in out of order uh, is not technically, um, it's not a simple problem. Uh, It does mean caching values um, and being able to look through uh, data quickly to see whether or not, an older data to see whether or not you actually have the best option. Then you have to also take into account what happens, okay, when they clear the books, like let's say IX clears the books and the asks and bids goes to zero. I mean, you don't want to show zero as an ask or a bid value. Um, so you then have to go back and say, okay, what was the uh, the best value prior to that point? Um, and then publish that out as well. I mean, these are some like small technical pieces, but there's a lot that goes into providing good, solid, accurate data that does very closely uh, mimic the SIP feed um, while doing it in real time. Yeah, it's extraordinarily complicated, um, but at the end of the day, it just amounts from the, for the customers because they've got you sitting in between all of this and handling all those complex problems. At the end of the day, what does it mean for them? It means they can get a, a feed with more volume at a lower cost? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And yeah, so, they get better data for less money. And I mean, isn't that what we all want? Is just more for less? Right. Value is the word for it. Um, yeah, there we go. You, yeah. Would you be able to add more feeds to this eventually if needed? Is there sort of like a, um, a diminishing return to adding more exchanges to a, a, a feed like this? Hell yeah, we can add more. That's actually like part of like the, uh, the design of the product is that we need to be able to add as many feeds as possible. The second part of your question, I don't know. Um, the hypothesis is that adding more feeds will improve data quality, as it should, right? I mean, the closer we get to actually being the SIP feed, the better, the closer we can be um, to mirroring its data. Um, I have a feeling, though, that there is some sort of uh, plateau function as the, with the more feeds you add, um, the harder and harder it is to actually add more value, sort of the law of diminishing marginal utility. I think you business guys would say something like that. Parsimony. That's the word. That's a, another good word. Look at your vocabulary. See, this is what happens when you're an engineer. You just lose all of that. That's a statistics term. Like when you're building a predictive model, you can get better predictions by adding more predictive variables, but you lose parsimony and generalizability and you end up overfitting the model. So same same thing here is that like once you have five, six, seven percent of market volume on your consolidated feed, does adding eight percent make a difference? Like what if you had 50% market volume? How much impact would going to 51% have? And I think the theory is that there is a not a linear relationship between um, adding volume to a feed and the proximity you get to the national best bid, best offer. So I guess we're going to find out. Absolutely. That's sort of the next thing on the agenda is yeah. to <laughs> qualify these statements. Can you uh, tell our listeners about how far into the fall are you still able to ride a motorcycle in Colorado? Oh, that's one of the greatest pieces about Colorado is you can ride a motorcycle damn near year round. Um, a lot of people, well, actually, I, I think anyone that's been to Colorado knows that we have some insane number of days of sun. I know it used to be like we had the most sunny days a year. So even in the middle of winter, it's not going to be snowy. It's going to be sunny. And you can hop on a bike and just go into the mountains. I mean, yeah, as long as you haven't had a snowfall recently or, you know, and you got to make sure there's not a lot of gravel on the roads from the uh, the gravel trucks that uh, lay it down after a snowfall. But you can ride pretty much your own. I actually prefer riding in like the fall and winter um, as opposed to uh, in the summer just because it's not as hot. God, I hate the heat on a bike. It's <laughs> air conditioning in a car is so nice. That's brutal. Um, well, you're uh, you're a super talented engineer and uh, living in the right place for riding motorcycles. Thanks for coming on the show, Evan. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me.